Okay, just a quick follow-up to my last video on sex versus gender. First off, for all of you commenters who said that gender originated as a linguistic term, roughly meaning category or type in terms of words, uh, nouns specifically, I'm very aware of that. Um, where the word originated and what its original use was is kind of immaterial to its current use in the context of human sexual behavior and differences in behavior and its necessity as a means of decoupling chromosomal sex from other aspects of sexuality. Now, it's not like the concept of gender is a new thing. Um, we had a concept of gender versus sex before the word gender was co-opted to describe it. There were mannish women and effeminate men all throughout history, and they were often described exactly in that way. The descriptors manly and ladylike don't apply to biological or chromosomal sex, but refer instead to traits that are associated um, primarily with one sex or the other. Now, if one were to compare someone like me to someone like Theron Meyer or maybe Blair White, at least on the surface in terms of how we choose to present our physical selves to the world, they're both much more feminine than I am, despite me being chromosomally female and them being chromosomally male. I'm not a feminine presenting woman. I have little interest in stereotypical feminine activities and pursuits, and I have many stereotypically masculine temperamental and behavioral traits. So without a concept of gender as distinct from biological or chromosomal sex, I, I'd just be a woman, genetically female. Nothing more to see here, folks. On the other hand, I would probably, it would probably not be pushing it to say that Theron and Blair have much more interest than I do in stereotypical female pursuits such as hairstyles, makeup, and fashion. But they'd just be male. Nothing to see here, folks. And if that's not enough of an example, I'm going to put it really plainly through a common example I think everybody who uh, is watching this video has come across in their lives. Um, gender describes things like the difference between a girly girl and a tomboy. Gender as a thing related but not identical to biological sex is a ubiquitous concept, and it has been since before we applied the word itself to the task of describing it. We were routinely using the concept in these ways long before feminism and gender theory came along. The concepts of male and female are related to, but not synonymous with, the concepts of masculine and feminine. Now that that's out of the way, I wanted to discuss an example of how gender can be misused or misapplied by people who have an ideological agenda to push. So I'm going to deal with the example of Daphna Joel, head of the psychobiology department at the University of Tel Aviv. She has a PhD in psychology and is a full professor there. So I want to bring in two studies she's co-authored, and I'm going to link you to at least the media write-ups on these studies. One involves MRI scans of almost 1,500 human brains, and the other involves a survey of about 5,000 individuals regarding their interests and behaviors. Her research has been cited by a guest on Lacey Green's Brawless, in mainstream news media, and she was interviewed on a panel discussion, you know, on an episode of The Agenda with Steve Pakin, and I will link those things in the low bar. Now, what her research on MRI scans found was that there was a significant overlap in, between male and female brains, sort of, right? That is, there were very, very few male brains that were 100% male in terms of all of their structural characteristics, and there were very, very few female brains that were similarly 100% female in terms of their structural characteristics. Most fell somewhere within a middle third on an overlapping set of bell curves. However, at both ends, and even within that middle third, the bell curves of men and women tended towards sex-typical brain structures. In other words, in terms of the constellation of brain structures associated with males and females, males tended to skew male more often than females did, and females to skew female more often than males did. This was particularly apparent on the male end of the spectrum. 
Her conclusion from this, one widely reported and repeated in media, is that the idea of a male brain or a female brain is a myth. However, I want to examine here some of the limitations of the data when issuing such a declarative statement. Now, it may well be that some brain differences are more strongly associated with one sex than others are. What if there was one brain structure whose characteristics could be designated as quintessentially rather than averagely male? That is, that this brain structure was male presenting in all males, including transgender women, and even in chromosomally male individuals with androgen insensitivity syndrome. What if there was more than one such structure? What if there were some small number of brain structures that are always male in male brains and always female in female brains? Well, that would not be reflected in the results of Dr. Joel's study, um, and it would not have any bearing on her interpretation of her data, because in her mind, unless all brain structures in males are quintessentially male, that brain is not a male brain. Unless all brain structures in females are quintessentially female, that brain is not a female brain. In order to be classified as a male brain or a female brain, um, which ended up being something along the lines of 1% of all brains, um, that brain had to be 100% in compliance with every single structure being compliant with the sex of the person. Now, despite even the obvious evidence of her own graphs, which show significant aggregate differences in the distribution of sex to brain structures, even when considering all brain structures together, lumping them all in, rather than you know taking each structure in isolation, she has declared her research to be evidence that there are no sex differences in the brain and no such thing as a male brain or a female brain. She has similarly interpreted her findings regarding the survey data on gender differences in interest and activity. Again, it was a rare finding that any individual only ever engaged in stereotypically masculine or stereotypically feminine activities and interests. And her determination was that gender differences in behavior and interest are, because of that, also a myth. So, here's the thing. A woman could be heavily involved in fashion, run a YouTube channel doing makeup tutorials, spend hours on her hair and nails, be taking interior design classes, sew, scrapbook, bedazzle, enjoy baking cookies as special thank yous for people who have done her favors, volunteer at her local preschool, and be working as a nurse. She could read romance novels and enjoy rom-coms and think that dude Ryan Gosling from The Notebook is the greatest thing since sliced bread. But if she's also interested in video games then that woman is no different than a guy who loves guns, trucks, and books about war, keeps track of his favorite baseballers, batting averages, plays fantasy football, lives to play first-person shooters, goes skidooing in the winter and quadding in the summer, dabbles in mixed martial arts, re prefers his porn to be visual rather than textual, hangs out in sports bars, but he's also a pastry chef. The idea that one of these individuals is girlier than the other, and that one is manlier than the other is, according to Dr. Joel, essentially a myth. So how and why would she claim this? Well, if you actually go and watch her appearance on that panel discussion on the agenda, you will see exactly how ideologically driven she is. She has not only engaged in a skewed interpretation of her own data, which clearly finds that men are more likely to have a predominance of masculine brain structures and behavioral traits, and women are more likely to have a predominance of feminine ones, but she asserts that in that discussion, that the mere act of studying biologically based sex differences is morally problematic. Why are people, she asks, so desperate to find and identify such differences. It could only be for the purpose of justifying unequal treatment, justifying prejudice, justifying injustice. And it is certainly true that scientific inquiry has in the past been used 
to justify all of those things. And it's entirely possible that the motivation behind any given inquiry has sometimes historically, and even presently, been in the service of these justifications. However, one thing Jordan Peterson, a uh, professor of psychology at the University of Toronto, said on that panel that really hit home with me, is that scientific inquiry in and of itself is neither moral nor immoral. It is a descriptive process, not a prescriptive one. Its goal is to describe reality. It's what you and others do with your findings that is subject to moral evaluation. Now, one can accept that for the most part, girls will be girls and boys will be boys without generating and, un and upholding a societal prescription out of that reality, without saying girls must be girls and boys must be boys, full stop, end of story, and neither the twain shall meet. If we are to have a just society that serves the needs of all individuals as best it can, then we must differentiate between descriptive and prescriptive ideas of gender. If we believe that sex differences are a myth, and that men and women are not measurably different from one another in personality, behavior, and interest, even on average, then we will see injustice where it doesn't exist. The motivation to correct that perceived injustice can and will lead us to actual injustices, and it arguably has already. Things like affirmative action for women in STEM, as well as the conspiracy theory that is the patriarchy, and all of the initiatives that have been introduced to try to dismantle it. Daphna Joel believes that any difference in outcome between men and women is due to external forces like discrimination, to unjustifiable differences in the treatment of men and women and in how boys and girls are socialized. To her, evidence that differential outcomes may actually be evidence of people being who they already are, doing what they already want to do, and having a plethora of choices from which to decide how they want to live, well, that, that's unwelcome. She has constructed her bogeyman through a great deal of intellectual and scholarly chicanery, and any suggestion that just maybe it's only the shadow of a tree branch on the bedroom wall, well, that's not only unwelcome, that's morally reprehensible to her. Anyhow, I hope this clarifies things a little bit as to why I think that the distinction uh, between feminism's understanding of gender and a scientific understanding of gender is so incredibly important. Um, scientific inquiry is a descriptive process, not a prescriptive one. Feminist inquiry seems to be 100% prescriptive, even in terms of how they're going to interpret their findings. Um, you know, that, that they can, that, that the conclusion can be, uh, completely different from what is even existing on their graphs. So just very, very troubling, uh, to me to see somebody, uh, in a position of that kind of authority, um, sitting on grant committees, heading up a department, um, that heading up the department of psychobiology, that's, that's, that's actually a semi-scientific department. That's really disturbing to me. So, anyhow, that's it for me for today, and I will see you 